Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Whether you're joining us live on the day or watching the video later, it's really great to have you with us as part of the global OWASP community. My name is John DeLeo, and I'll be your session moderator for the next couple of hours. I'm located in Auckland, where I'm a co-leader of the OWASP New Zealand chapter. Our first guest today during this block is Troy Hunt. Despite living and working from our little corner of the world on Australia's Gold Coast, he is a world-renowned security researcher and founder of the data breach notification service, Have I Been Pwned? Troy's background is in software development, and these days he's a regular conference speaker and trainer. Troy regularly blogs at troyhunt.com, where you can always hear about what, what's on his mind. Now today, we're going to hear a little bit about what's on his mind as we respond to some questions that you all are submitting. If you're joining us live, then you can go ahead and submit questions in the Slack channel on the OWASP Slack workspace. We are in the channel named 20th ANIV OWASP Standard Classification. Um, it's a little bit long, so the N is actually dropped off. So you can go ahead and join that channel and submit any questions that you think of. We've got a couple of starters for 10 that we'll go with before um, we look at and see if we've got any listener submissions with us live today. So Troy, I guess the, the first one, classic interview, tell us a little bit about yourself. In particular, what I'd really love to hear is this, your software development background. What was the first project you worked on for pay? Yeah, good question. So I I started building software for the web in 95 because I like I saw the internet and I went, this is really, really cool. It's like this might be something one day. I should uh, I, I should try and start learning a little bit about it. And I was I was at my first year of university then and I was like looking through the the course syllabus, whatever it was. And I'm trying to find like the web development courses. No web development. Like there was nothing at the time. So my beginning was I, I literally went and bought the for dummies book and somewhere on that shelf which my fiance is has very kindly color coded all the books <laughs> no longer coded by technology i got so somewhere in the yellow section down there is html for dummies uh, and that's the book that i, I started to learn for or, or learn from rather uh, and and i built my first websites literally using a for dummies book so that the first one that I can recall that that I built for money, and again, keeping in mind, this is probably about 96, I think, by the time I made any money from it, was a, a rental, a car went, rental website. And, and this was just like a static brochure site. And in fact, it was a, a company here in Southeast Queensland called Able, A-B-E-L. And I saw this sign the other day and I was in Brisbane walking around. And I was like, oh, I remember, I remember those guys. Uh, and I actually tried to find the website on archive.org the other day, but I think it's actually even too old for archive.org. <laughs> so by the time I found the first version, I was like, no, that's, that, that wasn't me. But yeah, there you go. a flat static brochureware car rental website. Yeah, definitely sounds familiar. What is this CGI script? You know, I, I wonder what that might do. <laughs> well, so I didn't have to worry about that because it, it, it had no service on functionality. It's just like HTML, maybe <laughs> you didn't even have to worry about CSS back then either. Ah, oh, nostalgia. So one of the things that, that's actually very interesting to me is, so what was the circumstance or what particular event inspired the creation of Have I Been Pwned? I, I think the, the catalyst, if, if we were to call it, that was the Adobe data breach. And, and there were a couple of things about Adobe that I thought was really interesting. And, and I'd sort of been analyzing a bunch of data breaches and writing blog posts about them mostly because I find it, the thing I find really interesting about data breaches is, is you get to see someone else's dirty laundry, right? So, oh, so you're storing passwords like that. <laughs> Why did you use that kind of key? Like, what on earth are you doing inside the system? And we, we've all got dirty laundry in, in systems that we've built. So looking at other people's is a little bit, I don't know, it's almost like a little bit voyeuristic, right? So I was finding it very interesting looking at data breaches. And then I started doing things like actually looking at, uh, patterns across breaches. So there was a, a point there I wrote a blog post about Sony and Gorka, two different data breaches, both passwords in plain text. Sometimes you have the same person in both breaches and hey, wouldn't you know it? Like they're using the same password. And we, we know that people do this, but having empirical data in front of you to demonstrate that, yeah, yeah, they really do. And like, this is how frequently it happens 
was really interesting. So when the Adobe data breach happened, there were more than 150 million people in that. I thought, wow, this is like a really, really big set of data. I'll have a look. And I found myself in Adobe twice. Uh, once was with my work account and once was with my personal account. And I thought that was fascinating because to the best of my memory, I, I hadn't given Adobe any of my data. But I was a big Macromedia Dreamweaver user uh, back in the, in the day. And of course, Adobe bought Macromedia. So my data flowed to somewhere else. And I kind of went, like, if, if I don't know that my data is held by a company and it's in data breaches, and I do give this stuff a lot of thought. So if I don't know this, like how many other people don't know? Maybe I should just like dump it all into a great big Azure table storage instance and put a web interface in front of it and then people can go and search. And, and that's where it started. And I, I honestly didn't think it'd be much more than that. I thought, oh, some of my mates will use it. You know, this will be, this will be a bit of fun. And uh, yeah, now like 11 and a half billion records later, here we are. Just, just a few records. Um, as, as the breaches have come in, has there been a breached entity that just really shocked you? Like you just thought they had their act together and this wouldn't happen. You know, I was, I was going to say Ashley Madison until you added the bit about they have their act together. And that would then demonstrate that I've been thinking a lot about Ashley Madison, which really wasn't <laughs> before the breach, which really wasn't <laughs> the case. Uh, I was going to say Ashley Madison because that's the one that shocked me in terms of the fact that, that it was so salacious and it had such dire consequences, you know, literally suicides on the back of that. Uh, but it, look, in, in terms of thinking that they really had their act together, if we're entirely objective about it, could we think today of a single organisation that would shock us if they had a breach? And I, I can't. <laughs> you know, I really can't. I, I mean, let's say it was Google who had a breach. It's all right. I'd, I'd be a little bit surprised insofar as they have all the money in the world to invest in this sort of thing and super, super smart technical people. However, they've got so much stuff out there and it only takes one little mistake. So I, I don't think I would be shocked if Google had a substantial data breach. I, I don't think I'd be shocked if anyone did. And it's, it's just interesting when you think about people sort of saying, you know, like, who's your, who should you trust with your data, right? So which websites should you sign up to? Don't sign up to these ones over there because they look dodgy. Sign up to these ones because they look professional. And then I'm like, what? You mean professional like Adobe and Dropbox and LinkedIn? You know, I mean, that's that's just... That's just not a measure of how likely your data is to be taken. Sometimes I, I often think that maybe it's, it's sort of the other way around, that when, when you see that they've invested a lot in that polished facade, I wonder where they skimped. <laughs> well, you, you know what I think's the other way around? So I had a question. Oh, geez, did it? I lose track, but I think it was like yesterday in another AMA very similar to this. And someone was like, uh, how likely uh, are people to leave an organisation once they've been breached? Because obviously the implication there is that this is an organisation with poor security. And I, 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 the bit that I think is the other way around is organisations that have been breached have had some very, very good firsthand experience of being breached. They have a, a heightened awareness of security beyond that of the organization which, which hasn't been breached. So I'm, I'd be really reticent to say, look at Adobe and go, well, I'm not going to trust them with my data again. I'm going to go to this other company over here who is also a big name, who hasn't had a data breach, and, and somehow that is going to be a better security posture. I, I, I feel that that's, that's just completely the wrong way around. Fair point. <clears throat> Now, actually, we had one question that was submitted earlier just around the breach data itself. And they mentioned, I'm interested in everything to do with two-factor authentication. Do you see in the breach data information on usage of two-factor? Basically, are, are you able to glean some information about adoption rates by users from the breach data you're getting? So we, uh, we don't need data breaches for that. Um, and in fact, I'm just trying to look up the reference here. There was a, it's a bit in the news about Twitter the other day who was saying it was something like 2% of their subscriber base uh, uses 2FA. 
And we've sort of gone, like, that's like 2%. Like, why don't you let more people know? Uh, well, actually, to finish answering your question, um, I, I don't usually see information in data breaches about 2FA adoption. And, and to be honest, there's a lot of organisations out there that don't even offer it in the first place. Uh, some of the more mainstream ones do, but a lot of the larger ones like Twitter, social media platforms, banks, we haven't really seen data breaches in recent years. I'm, I'm saying this just whilst I've said LinkedIn, but of course that was back in 2012, Dropbox was 2012 as well. But what's really interesting is when you do look at the figures which organisations publish about adoption rates, and they're all like stunningly, stunningly low. And, and I remember uh, years ago, I had a chat to someone at Dropbox uh, after seeing similar figures. And I was like, but, but 2FA is like so good, but why don't you push this harder? And they said, well, the, the problem is, is that when we push it harder, we have to deal with a lot of other account lockout problems. And then the problem you're dealing with is you get someone emailing the support desk and they're like, hey, I went to your website and I turned on 2FA so that if someone has my username and my password but not my soft token authenticator, they can't log in. Uh, I have my username and password, but I don't have my soft token authenticator. Can you please let me in? <laughs> and then they're like, well, which one, which one was it? Like, what, what do you want? And inevitably, then you fall back to much more laborious, time-consuming, resource-intensive processes to try and verify that this is the actual owner of the account and not someone trying to break through the very defense that the actual owner of the account put in there in the first place. And, and I think the overarching problem is that 2FA is just a very blunt, very user unfriendly implementation. Some of it's better than others, but for the most part, this is why we see really, really low adoption rates. Yeah, I, I think really Twitter does a pretty good job of it. I can't remember the last time I entered a Twitter 2FA code. It's probably the last time I set up a new device. But still, we're like these tiny, tiny fractions of a percent. Another submitted question that's also piqued my interest a little bit. What do you think we'll see? So at some time in a, in a glorious, rosy future, do you think that we'll see an industry standard change password type API so that users could have their password management tools manage password rotation for them? Is that so, even uh, possible? And then the next part of the question would be, and if we could do it, should we? Yeah, uh, and I think that the second part is actually the really interesting bit. Uh, and, and maybe if we start there, because part of the problem is, and I've, I've been a, a massive proponent of password managers for a very long time, Part of the problem is that if you have a password manager, so I've got all my things in, in one password, for example. Uh, so I have them in one password. Every time I create an account, I have like 40 random characters or something like that, which are completely unique across every web asset. Now, if, if you're having long, strong, genuinely strong and unique passwords on every single web asset, does it actually make sense to be rotating them on a regular basis? Like the, the value proposition of that then goes down. It'd be different if it's like, yeah, I have my dog's name on every single website that I use. And then as soon as your dog's name get compromised from one place, not only does it potentially get cracked if it's stored as a hash because it's going to be a weak password and the sort of thing that will be cracked, but then of course it's in plain text somewhere and that immediately unlocks everything else. Like that's that I see as, as needing rotation, but then you're not, you're not really solving the root cause of the problem, are you? And once you solve the root cause of the problem, you don't really need rotation, certainly not in the, in the same way as before. Now, should we have a, a standard implementation for password reset? I think that would be nice. I think it would also be nice to have a standard implementation even just for login. I mean, look at the way password managers do it. You, you go to a website and you hit submit and it's looking at the DOM and it's looking at the network request and it's trying to figure out what is the name of the password field and what is the name of the username field so that like we can come back and pre-populate. Like this is, this is just a reminder of how much the web is stuck together with sticky tape. Right? Like that feels like a very, very, very rough way of doing it. So I, I would like to see a standard implementation there, but to the best of my knowledge, and I really would love someone to prove me wrong with this as well, that there's not much, uh, not much happening in that space. Thanks for that. Uh, we got a question submitted on the Slack channel. Thank you, Chris. And he says, 
I have found the ability to get details from have I been pwned for domains I own to be very valuable. Is this a widely used feature? Everyone I tell about it isn't even aware it's possible. Yeah, so uh, maybe they don't know about it because I hide the domain search feature under a big link on the top of the website, which says domain search. The number of times people go to the website and then they email me and say, is there a way of doing domain search? And I'm like, yeah, click the domain search link and then follow the instructions. So I, I, I think it's pretty obvious, but then again, if multiple people are missing it, maybe not. Uh, so the, the answer to the question is yes, it's very popular. I haven't done any detailed stats on it for a couple of years now, but the last time I did, it was more than half the Fortune 500 were using it. Um, all getting it for free too. So good on those guys. <laughs> it works well. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, I'm not a very good businessman. Uh, so it, yeah, look, it's used really extensively there by a lot of big brands. It's also used uh, very extensively now by governments. There are 27 different governments that are doing TLD-wide searches for gov uh, domains, which is which is super super cool. Uh, I, I forget the exact number of searches that are done, but I, I know that every time I load data and I, I see the numbers about how many people get notified, uh, that there's always a substantial number of organisations that are getting notified that email addresses on their domains have been in a breach. So yeah, look, it 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 seems to work, <laughs> and people seem to be happy with it. Okay, thank you. Now, another question that was submitted by one of my local colleagues here. So he pointed out the fact that, that you are a strong proponent of ubiquity gear and also that you love, just love jet skiing. So <laughs> he was asking if you've considered the possibility of combining those two loves by providing say, uh, um, access points afloat for recreational boaters. I feel like I have a blog post for just about everything. So I have a blog post from March 2017 titled How I Finally Fix the Dodgy Wi-Fi on My Jet Ski with Ubiquity's Unify Mesh. <laughs> so there, there is a blog post for this, which was more yeah. about uh, using their tech to create mesh networks so that I could get enough coverage from my house down onto my, my pontoon where the, where the jetty gets moored. So if I want to sit in my jet ski down there, uh, I, I have Wi-Fi, <laughs> so so there's, there's that. I, I do um, I do find it interesting. I've got uh, 14 ubiquity access points around the house in different places now, and I can go over to my my neighbor's place, which is across the water. We live on on the water here, and it must be 100 meters over there. And like I can sit in their backyard and have Wi-Fi at home, which is um, which is I don't know. It's, it's geeky, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> 100 meters, wouldn't that be nice? I have to be careful when I go around the corner to the kitchen because we have steel studs. <laughs> ah, right. Well, you know, that the biggest problem that, that I have with with um, with connectivity and, uh, or, or range, as most people probably know, like the, it depends on what is between you and the access point. So I have a Ubiquiti uh, G4 doorbell, which is a really, really cool doorbell. The problem is, is that the doorbell is on the other side of a solid concrete wall. So... It's like I have an access point just here. Uh, I almost have line of sight bar the, the, the house, or the wall of the house, which you can get good signal through. But then it goes down about, I don't know, probably like 10 metres, and there's a solid wall. And then the doorbell, which only works over Wi-Fi, keeps dropping off. So occasionally I've got someone like literally banging on the door because they're like, dude, your doorbell doesn't work. In fact, your doorbell is literally glowing red and says can't connect to Wi-Fi, which isn't a very professional look <laughs> when people come over to your house. <laughs> So I, I think they need like a they need an external antenna or, or something on that thing. Excellent. All right, one more question here. So um, feel free to talk about this one for as long as you want while I think of some other things to ask you. What do you think are the unique security risks in the AI and machine learning space? I I kind of feel that the the AI and ML bit does become a little bit hyperbolic in the same way as as blockchain <laughs> it comes a bit hyperbolic. I remember I was at um, uh, InfoSec EU uh, in London a couple of years ago, back when we used to go places, remember that? And I'm walking around like this massive hall and it's, it, it's a very similar to a Black Hat style thing where there's just like vendors and stuff everywhere. And there's this one stand which is selling, literally the, the, the name on the stand was Next Gen Blockchain. 
So they come and buy next gen blockchain. And it just made me laugh because so much of it is, is obviously pitched at, at sales managers and, and people making purchasing decisions who may not be that in tune with the tech. I, I, I think what's interesting about the whole AI and ML bit is it, it's all still just code, right? And it, it might be self-learning or self-healing code or code which can write itself. It's still just code. <laughs> this is what's underneath the whole thing. Um, I guess for, for code that, that can learn and evolve on its own, I, I think that makes it really interesting on both sides of the fence in InfoSec because on, on the one hand we're saying, I, I suspect this question was very much around, like what if the bad guys get it? You know, What if the bad guys start using AI so that the robots get smarter and in some sort of like Skynet world, they somehow manage to pwn more things? And it's like, yeah, okay, that's, that, that's, that's a reasonable concern. Uh, the good guys have got it too. <laughs> so we're seeing AI-style behaviours increasingly make their way into, into defensive technologies too. Uh, and, and even if we think about the way that defensive tech is getting smarter, things like user behavioural analytics, like isn't it really cool now that we can have software that doesn't just look for like known bad patterns but starts to understand the way people interact with machines? And because it can understand the way they interact with machines, it can start to identify deviations from the norm. Uh, I like getting away from very sort of uh, binary security positions such as, is your username and password correct? Yes, cool. Okay, you get in and you get to do anything. I like the more UBA style approach where we might say, look, uh, an organization is running, uh, let's say some form of, of endpoint security where uh, Bob normally logs into the sales department each day and he does a bit of work on his spreadsheets and that's it. One day, uh, Bob logs in from Beijing and pulls down five gigabytes worth of marketing material. It's like, well, maybe it's not Bob. You know, It doesn't matter that the username and password are right. This is not a behavioral norm for Bob. Uh, so that's where I, I think we have a lot of potential in that, that AI space. And it just sits on the other side of the scale to the, to the people doing malicious things with access to AI. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we got a couple more questions in. And so a, a little bit of a challenge about, um, or maybe, you know, can you lift, lift the covers a little around, have I been pwned itself? And the, the listener was asking, our search is locked. How does that affect data privacy? Does this get shared with anyone? Yeah, good question. Not as far as I know. <laughs> so it certainly doesn't explicitly happen. Not intentionally? Um, no, it's, you know, one of the, the joys of Have I Been Pwned is that it, it is such a simple, simple, simple thing. It's, it's like what you see is pretty much what you get. There's a box on the front and you press submit and it makes a query and then it comes back and pulls back the data. So that there is a section in the FAQs there uh, about logging uh, and it says nothing is explicitly logs. If you, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I remember what does get recorded for various reasons, which I'll explain what doesn't. But certainly that front page when you do a search, no, it doesn't log in a thing, certainly not at a code level. There are transient logs, which uh, both Cloudflare will store. So everything goes through Cloudflare. So I do have the ability to pull back. I think it's about like one hour of queries from Cloudflare logs and they get purged. There will be logs that happen on the Azure side of things. Everything is, is sort of turned off to the fullest extent possible, but... I could sit there and literally watch the queries that are coming through uh, in real time. There's a little terminal you can pop up and it, it shows every request coming through. Uh, so, you know, that, that, would, be, that would be possible. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why things like the Pwn Passwords feature has, has an anonymity model on it. It's like, look, let's, let's just remove any concern whatsoever and make sure that even if I logged everything, for at least for that particular uh, feature, then I couldn't do anything with it anyway domain searches, going back to that, there is some logging on the domain search. First of all, that's how I know about the Fortune 500 thing. But second of all, I, I, I need that because the domain search goes through a verification process where you need to initiate the search and then there needs to be a, a point at which you either receive a confirmation email to one of the standard email addresses on the domain or uh, make a DNS entry or, or, or other. So there has to be this sort of persistence. There's probably an argument to be made about is this the sort of thing that could be purged over time? But then again, there's there's a bit of value to this too. And, and the, the thing that came immediately to mind is I, I mentioned the government uh, situation before when I unboard, uh, unboarded, onboarded <laughs> the first government, which was the UK, 
Uh, one of the things that was actually really valuable is I said, look, it, it'd be great if we knew how many people uh, are doing searches against .gov.uk assets. Like we're government. We don't always talk real well <laughs> between each department. Be cool to know which departments around the UK are actually using this service. And then we can like roll everyone up into this one thing. We can do it centrally. We can add all the other departments which aren't using it already. Uh, and it was it was just the domain search history there, which again is sort of a, I guess a necessary part of being able to do the verification, which was useful for that. So yeah, I, I guess that's uh, that that's the answer. But if, if you want more details for the person who asked that question, go to the FAQs and, and have a look at it there, or, or ping me on Twitter if anyone's got specific questions as well. You're muted, John. <laughs> I did that, of course. In the lockdown life, you know, stuff is going on in the kitchen. So it's like, oh, I better mute. You know, lunch is getting made. So the question that just came in, you partner with many different organizations and perhaps some people might find some of those questionable. What do you feel is the benefit of allowing intelligence agencies to have ingestion pipelines from Have I Been Pwned? You know, for a moment, I was like, hey, I thought they were all really nice, which is a questionable one. But I, I, I suspect the question here is around uh, some of the governments. So there's 27 governments. There's been a couple of the governments, and I, I'm going to avoid calling them out by name at the risk of offending someone from one of these company, uh, countries, rather, because it, I think what the, the asker of this question is implying is that they don't like, say, the... Uh, the, the human rights history, for example, in, in one of these one of these countries. Um, assuming this is the case, and it's not just like, look, you don't like Ubiquity or Lenovo or One Password or Nord. I think they're the ones I have relationships with. Uh, assuming that's the case, we've got to remember for these governments, uh, and I'll, I'll pick Australia. No one gets too upset about Australia because we don't really do a lot <laughs> in terms of upsetting other parts of the world. Don't believe what's on the news at the moment. It's hyperbolic. Anyway. Um, the Australian government can go through and query any one of the domains that they have control over with or without my support. They, they literally just go to domain search. And then if they want to search, say, cyber.gov.au, they're like, okay, cool. I'll just get an email to that address or I'll upload a file or DNS entry or something, and they can do the search. So they've always had that ability. And the relationships with the governments is, is to, to try and remove some of the mechanical barriers that are designed to stop abuse and to make it easier for them to access the data they have access to anyway. The, the, the other thing that I'd, I'd sort of say there, and again, assuming someone's referring to a government that they view as dystopian or something to that effect, um, this is their data. And, and I'm very much of the view that when I'm in a data breach, and I was in another one just the other day, but when I'm in a data breach, that's my data that, that's there in that breach and I should have access to it. Uh, and if it's a company that's in there uh, or their email addresses are in there, that's, that's their data and they should have access to it. So it's, I believe it's the same as governments. They should have easy access to that. Now, that said, there, there are limits. So if we pick some easy ones, if, um, if Kim Jong-un pops up tomorrow and goes, hey, you know, can, you, uh, can you help out uh, glorious nation North Korea with domain searches? Uh, that, that's pretty easy because we have export controls <laughs> over, over North Korea. We have export controls over other parts of the world. And we, we have a Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is very explicit about what sorts of uh, goods and services you can offer to some parts of the world. And that's not something that I'd break because I'm pretty sure bad stuff happens to you if you do that. But if it's just simply that there is another part of the world whose, whose policies uh, you know, we, we are not as aligned to as say Australia or the UK or, or New Zealand. When's New Zealand coming on, John? Maybe you can talk to someone. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, yeah, so that, I, I think that's where the question was and that's, that's my feeling on it. Yeah, that actually was the follow-up. Have you ever said no to anyone? All right. um, let us just say I stopped returning emails in one case. <laughs> so. And I, I see we have just about a minute left. And I'll actually give you an opportunity to do a plug if you'd like. Uh, Chris was asking if you have plans for any future online courses, such as with Pluralsight. Uh, we are talking about a, a few different things. The, the stuff that's, that's in the pipeline coming out at the moment, we've released the first episode of this, was we've done a, a series for one password called Hello CISO, 
Uh, and, and this is cool because, look, I mean, Pluralsight's really cool, but it's something that you pay for when you get a subscription and, and so on and so forth. The series we're doing with 1Password, it's just, it's just on YouTube. <laughs> it's free and available to everyone. So we've uh, put the first episode out a few weeks ago. I think we're going to try and do about one a month, uh, and that's going to keep us going until well into next year as well. So keep an eye on those ones. All right. Well, thank you so much, Troy. I see that we've just reached the top of the hour, so our time is up. And we thank you again for joining us today and, and look forward to speaking with you soon. Cool. Thanks for having me, guys.